So uh, good evening, welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Alastair Roth, Executive Director at AWI Victoria. Uh, so welcome to the Zoom audience, uh, members of AWIA, members of uh, other branches, and uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps joining us. So to discuss the topic of food security, or rather the lack thereof, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome from New Zealand Professor Alexander Gillespie. Alexander's with Waikato University. Um, it's late in the evening his time, so great of you to, to take the trouble to join us. Um, his areas of scholarship pertain to international and comparative environmental law, the laws of war, civil liberties, and other pressing issues of social concern. He's very widely published, at least uh, 17 books, uh, 40 academic articles. Um, he's had uh, various scholarships awarded and was the first New Zealander to be named Rapporteur for the World Heritage Convention involving international environmental diplomacy under the auspices of UNESCO. So a long and uh, detailed bio there, but um, very interested to have you with us, Alexander. Thank you very much. And I'll hand across to you to talk about food insecurity. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Alistair. It's great to be here. It's nice to be talking with Australians. This is a relationship which I, I value very much and I feel increasingly as we get into difficult times, the importance of the New Zealand and Australian connection is more than ever coming to the forefront. And initially, when I was going to do this talk, I was trying to think of a way which tied our two cultures together. And the obvious one is that we share the same greeting of g'day. So, so I think that's appropriate. But the, the one you're probably not aware of is the Anzac tradition, because obviously we're very connected in terms of our Anzac heritage. But it was the first outing the Australians had offshore was to New Zealand and to the Waikato, which is where I live. And so the Australians came across and they were part of the, the Crown forces that, that were involved in some rather difficult battles. You also lent us your first boat, which we're very appreciative for. We're, we're not part of the new AUKUS agreement, but we were at one point much closer. Um, I was mentioning to Alistair before about uh, some of the earlier work I did in, when I was a younger man. And I, I've been reminiscing lately about what international politics and international law used to be. And I, I've come to the conclusion that the one person I miss right now is Monica Lewinsky, because that was a time when international issues were so much lighter than what they are today. We, we, I begin many of my lectures with my students just saying it didn't always used to be this pressing or this exciting or indeed this dangerous. Um, I'm going to talk for maybe 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. I'll see how I go. But I'm, I'm going to raise a lot of controversial issues and hopefully we'll, we'll take it with questions after that. Now, I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint and I will start it from, here we go. Yep, um, and that's looking good. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair, that's great. <laughs> I'm glad. I was saying before, my biggest fear about tonight was the technology more than the actual talk, because, I'm, yeah, I'm always at battle with it. Um, so the topic is, is war, famine, and the Ukraine. And it's a, a topic which is large and difficult, and in many ways we are in uncharted waters. Um, I, I wanted to begin with, just going back a little bit, because I, I, I believe where we are now is at a very difficult point of history. And in, in contemporary history, everything we've got now dates from the Second World War. And I've got at one of our great prime ministers, Peter Fraser, because he was very much involved in the, the Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter. But, but two a couple of things here I wanted to just talk about was, was that when the United Nations was formed, we forget that it was as a body that was fighting for various principles against fascism. And we, we dreamt of a much better world. But as, as we were doing that, one thing that New Zealand and Australia did is that we signed the Canberra Pact of 1944, 
Now, I'm not sure if you guys still remember this, but it's still important to us because this is the only treaty that New Zealand is legally obliged to defend another country with. And so New Zealand is legally obliged to defend Australia if you're attacked or vice versa if we're attacked, which I must admit tends to make us a little bit nervous when you get on some very difficult conversations with some of your neighbours, because wherever you go, we will be right behind you. But the other part I wanted to talk about was with regards to the UN Charter. And I, I, I was looking at this language again today and I was just struck by it and the way it begins, we the people, not we the nations. And it was written by men and women who had twice in one lifetime had been involved in cataclysmic conflicts, the First World War and then the Second World War. And so then we, when we rebuilt the new model that they tried to rectify so many of those mistakes that they had in the League of Nations, which was somewhat utopian, but didn't have that political balance correct. But we, we started off and we had that vision of large and small nations coming together and in which justice and international law can be maintained. And I, I think as we talk about the Ukraine, it's important to keep going back to think about those words and those principles in the UN Charter. Now, as we know, and as you're, you will all know as scholars, is we, we, we made a deal in the UN Charter. And the, the essence of this deal was that we would ensure that the most powerful countries had a seat at the top table and a political control through the veto. And those permanent five are obviously uh, Russia, America, France, Britain and China. And there you can see the, the top five representatives. And so it, it's always difficult for me because I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training. And as we know in the international realm, it's not really international, it's not law as we know it. It's somewhere between politics, ethics and law. And the Security Council is part of that. But what we saw and, and bottom line is that the whole purpose of the United Nations and the Security Council, from my perspective, is that it was designed to stop the Third World War and that it was designed to have a, a series of checks and balances and development ideals and principles so that we wouldn't repeat the same mistakes that we had earlier. And all in all, that largely worked, if we are honest, between 1945 and the year 2001 and there, there were there was certainly it wasn't always plain sailing and there were difficulties but you could argue now that some of the challenges that we've got are unprecedented because with the power that we gave the permanent five came certain responsibilities these were in essence the police officers of the world that would control the use of force especially for offensive purposes now, that challenge started to become very difficult as we entered the 21st century. And many will know that the history and the patterns of the veto, but what we saw from about 2011 onwards was a increasing distancing of the responsibilities and aspirations we hoped for with the United Nations and Security Council and what we got. And to my mind, the exemplar of this failure was with Syria, whereby even though Russia was lawfully uh, being an ally to the Assad regime, they kept the whole conflict off the Security Council radar. And so every time that the veto, every time that a, a resolution came up about war crimes or humanitarian assistance, anything that was seen as potentially negative was vetoed by either Russia or China. And so I, I date the decline of where we are now, not at the beginning of 2022 when the Ukraine was invaded again, but earlier in 2011. And we can go backwards and forwards, but the point is, is that there was a disintegration, more or less from the time that Obama and Putin were both in power at the same time, and, and relationships have deteriorated and to the point that we're, we're now at this level where the, the Ukraine is invaded. Now, just a, a few points about this and that the, 
the, the first thing is that from the international law perspective, it was clearly and is an illegal invasion. And, and the, the way we can explain that is by the, the ruling and the, the wisdom of the International Court of Justice. Even though Russia did not turn up to contest the hearing, the, the, it's unequivocal that the Russians should not have been there. And this opened up a whole new world for us. And in this slide, you can see I've got the New Zealand part because it, it's good to know where, where the Kiwis are coming from. And the significance here is that for us, where we joined the willing to condemn what has happened in the Ukraine almost straight away, because it was an illegal invasion. There was no justification which would allow it to be ethical or legally correct. And that meant for us, we then moved into a new situation where we applied sanctions, but the sanctions were not based on the UN. We've always used UN, the UN, as the basis for our sanctions policy. So it was easy to put sanctions on Libya or on North Korea, for example. But we've now had to realize that our foreign policy moves beyond what was the sacrosanct nature of the UN. We've also opened up immigration options for Ukrainian people who are fleeing from the country. And after a surprisingly small debate, we've also provided military equipment. Uh, we'll provide non-lethal military aid, uh, military equipment. Most of the equipment or support we do is in terms of finance, where we, we provide money uh, and the Ukrainians can choose what they want to do with it weapons wise. And we've also been involved in the United Kingdom with the training of the Ukrainian soldiers. And so we're advancing quickly. And of course, our prime minister, and I, I know um, Morrison is no longer your prime minister, but the New Zealand prime minister, along with the Australian prime minister, and also the leaders of South Korea and Japan are going to be at the, the NATO summit this week uh, in Madrid. And the significance well, there's two things going on. First of all, you've got the group of seven, we well, have got three things going on. You've got the group of seven meeting right now and the G7, and they're gonna be working out a number of the economic aspects of the current situation. And we may see some more sanctions evolve from that. You've got the NATO meeting of which <clears throat> this is hugely significant, especially in the way that the the invited people and the high level of people going with our prime minister, your prime minister, and these other leaders, it's expanding it. The, to me, even though it's a North Atlantic organization, the significance of a wider body, the possible expansion of the focus of NATO to maybe include China, which we can debate backwards and forwards, and there'll probably be a debate around uh, the amount we spend on the military domestically. Just this evening, uh, New Zealand announced that we're going to be giving more aid to the Ukraine. And so we can expect both countries to be doing more in terms of offering the, the Ukraine in the next few days. Whether our prime ministers go and visit the Ukraine, um, I think symbolically it would be great. But, and this is the third thing, Mr. Putin seems to be busy with his cruise missiles right now, trying to make Kiev a very unattractive place to visit. Um, now, the, the strategic alliances of New Zealand mean that we are historically have been a little bit more distant from where Australia is. We are part of ANZUS, we are part of the Five Eyes, we've got a plethora of free trade agreements and these are growing well. But what we've seen lately is that we are not part of the AUKUS agreement, which has caused some concern in New Zealand, although there's a lot of practical reasons why we're not there and we're not part of the quad. And so even though New Zealand and Australia start out very closely together with the Canberra Pact and with ANZUS, where we are in recent years has become a little bit divided, even though we share similar principles, but the NATO connection to the Ukraine is pulling us back together. But one last thing I wanted to talk about before I talk about the, the starvation issue was, was just what's happening in the Pacific, because I think this is changing the way that New Zealand and Australia have to operate 
better in the future. Now, we all know the difficulties that have occurred with the influence of some countries in the Pacific, which are not traditionally in the area. And it's because they've created, we have created a gap. And so what we've seen is that New Zealand and Australia, although we've always had a strong influence in the Pacific and provide up to 65% of the aid, we don't, to be honest, give a lot. There's a graph there in the top left-hand corner of what is the UN target for aid. And it's a 0.7% figure from your gross national income. And New Zealand is not great at 0.28, but it's actually better than Australia, which is nothing to be proud about for either of us. But we're starting to change. And the last thing I wanted to say about that was the Partners in Blue Pacific, which has come through from the White House uh, on Friday evening. And this is the new vision by Australia, Japan, the UK, the US and New Zealand, whereby we're going to be supporting the Pacific Islands Forum, which is great. And so we're going to be much more regional. We're going to be more efficient, more coordinated. We have promised to individually increase our aid efforts, more transparent. And here's a good thing. We're saying we'll be cooperative with others who want to come in where, where possible. So what all that was trying to tell you is that the world is changing and it's a changing for New Zealand, it's changing for Australia, it's changing for all of us in terms of the bilateral relationships in the Pacific and the multilateral ones at the UN. But now, but this is the part that you want me to get my teeth into, um, the laws of war, starvation. The, 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 the thing about starvation is it is incredibly inhumane and indiscriminate. And it, so as a ethical principle, it is a poor type of warfare. If you're just fighting soldiers, it's, a, it's legitimate to starve the opposition. But as a practice, the, the way it used to work was that before the 19th century, when you had sieges of areas, and you can imagine castles, you would, it was permissible to not only sack an area once it fell, but also to try to starve them into submission. And th this was an established practice. It was only in the 19th century that it began to change. And where we have change around the rules of starvation come from the laws of blockade. And blockade is whereby you, where you, you effectively, and this is, it's a different age, it's the age of sail, it's before planes. And so you could put your navy and you could stop food and goods going to another country. Now, the, the debate historically, especially up into the Napoleonic periods, was what you could stop. Like everyone agreed you could stop contraband, like weapons or munitions. But they went backwards and forwards over whether blockade would cover things like food, which the civilians would try to and desire. Um, in, in the Napoleonic Wars, the, the British rather cunningly started off their blockade of Europe trying to stop the, the sugar and the coffee, um, thinking that if they could stop the coffee flow going into the continent, that <laughs> the, the Napoleon's allies and the French would go um, absolutely lose themselves. It may be a more effective tactic today if you stop the coffee flow into Australia and New Zealand, but back then it didn't really work. Anyway, the the idea only comes up after the Crimean War that you can't stop the flow of food. And so 1856, we agree, you can have contraband can be blockaded and you can say no weapons or munitions to help the opposition, but you can't stop food. And so in theory, food from 1856 becomes a free good that can go backwards and forwards. Now, that that idea in, in theory, as you get into the 20th century, still kind of holds good and it, it's got some credit to it. Um, but you get before the First World War, you, you get what we call the Hague Conventions, and we start to put some meat on the bones of international um, conflict law. And the, the basic rules were that. Um, Again, neutral countries could trade with belligerents during times of conflict, but not contraband. Um, in practice, there was a gap between the law 
and what happened. And you did see a blockade of Europe by the Allies, which, which was quite nasty, especially after the armistice going towards the end of the First World War. But, but we will leave that aside. D during the Second World War, starvation became a much more common method of conflict. And it was uh, envisaged by the Americans on Japan. It was definitely used by the Nazis on the Soviets. And so, and the, the, the Nazis also, of course, tried to control by the Atlantic, the amount of food and munitions and fuel getting to Britain, of which you had the, the, the problems with the convoys. Um, so end result, but Second World War, you get a, a trend again between not stopping neutral goods that are non-contraband, but in practice, starvation was practiced as a method of warfare. After the war, Geneva Conventions gets better. We, we start to say more clearly that you cannot stop the flow of food going into an occupied zone. And you must remember that the Geneva Conventions, especially Geneva 4, is thinking very much about the, the horrors of the occupation of the Nazis in Europe. And, and so we, we start to get clearer principles of what was happening. But what this is showing you here is that when you get famine, and this is some of the worst famines that we've had since the 1860s, although there's often an overlap with war, it is typically not an international war. And when you have a bad famine, they're more and often internal. And there's another trend, which is that they are often related to uh, very strong armed regimes, uh, communists, uh, autocrats, not democracies. Not always. Historically, the colonies had some terrible, uh, some terrible famines. Probably the worst famine in recent history was in India in the 1870s when it was under the British jurisdiction. But if you look at the, the trend and you can, uh, you can work, you can see them going down there before the First World War, then they come up and they start to peak in the 1920s. You get some terrible famines in the 1940s, which is the Second World War, which we talked about. And then you, the, the, after the war, the worst ones are with the Chinese Revolution. And then it falls rapidly. The, the ones in Cambodia and the 1970s. So many of this generation will recognize the, the ones in the 1980s. And so like when people think about Band-Aid and Bob Geldof, that, that's where they are. But you see also a number that kind of, it starts to go up a little bit in the 1990s and 2000s. The, the point to note with the graph on the right, and that's human population, is that human population is growing rapidly. We're, we're at 7 billion, we're going to be 11 billion. The thing to underline is that people do not starve because of ecological scarcity. People starve because of bad economics, corruption, and often disjointed and evil conflict reasons where it's intentional to make them starve. It's, so people do not starve because there's not enough food on the planet. Now, the way that looked in terms of law as we moved through the, the last part of the 20th century and into the 21st is that this is when we actually made starvation as a method of warfare prohibited. And so we say it unequivocally in 1977 with the additional protocols. And so this is for international conflict and non-international conflict like civil war. Same wording, starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is prohibited. And that, that's, that's clear. We, we have a similar principle with the rules on armed conflict at sea, which we call the San Remo Manual. And this says blockades are lawful, but not if they're for the purpose of starving the civilian population. The International Criminal Court in 1998 adds to the debate and again, it says it is a war crime to intentionally starve civilians uh, if, as related to the Geneva Conventions. And the Security Council, even before the invasion of the Ukraine, last time they said it in 2018, is you cannot use hunger as a weapon of war. Now, on top of that, you've also got a large amount of 
human rights and development jurisprudence. So you've got the, the laws of war on the one hand say you cannot use starvation. And then on the human rights and development side, you've got the sustainable development goals and their predecessor, the MDGs, and the goal is zero hunger. And so socially, and also in terms of war, we agree that starvation is a, a very bad thing and it is prima facie prohibited as a method of war. Now, of course, even though we have made good progress on the starvation debate in recent decades, and, and we really have as a species done quite well with the SDGs and the MDGs, there's still a lot of people who are very hungry in this world. And the figures I use for this come from the World Food Programme, and you're, you're welcome to go and go and check them because it's important to use a good source on this. But uh, as a broad number, 811 million people are hungry each day. The number who are now facing food insecurity is growing. And at the moment, there are 44 million people in 38 countries on the edge of famine. Now, if you want to work out where those countries are, you can see, uh, obviously, in South America, you have Venezuela. If you come across to Africa, you've, you've got Central Africa. You've got a fair bit of risk going down the East Coast, a bit on the Horn of Africa. You've also got to have a warning around Pakistan and India as well. And so this is where, where they're seeing it. But the World Food Programme yesterday, yesterday, it, 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 it was doing great work trying to keep this problem at bay. But then something's changed. And what has changed is that we are now aware that something is foreseeable. And what is foreseeable is the food crisis. The amazing thing about these two pictures is that you've got the Guardian on one hand and you've got the Economist on the other. And for once, they actually agree with each, each other. And they're both seeing the same crisis. And that is, if the current trends continue, that we can expect a calamity in the near future. And the, the statement going down the side comes from the Secretary General of the United Nations. And he's talking about unprecedented global hunger. And so everyone is now seeing the same problem. Now, the, the problem that we're seeing is this. And the essence of the difficulty is that food is becoming too expensive. And it's not a question of ecological scarcity. It's a question of economic scarcity. Now, what I'm trying to show you with these graphs here is the, if you look at the one in the top left-hand corner, that's the price of food generically, like all the food sorts, sorts and types put together. And food prices today in 2022 are higher than what they were in the peak periods. And there were some nasty famines in the early 1970s. So we're looking at food prices growing very quickly. The, the middle graph is trying to tell you that different food sources are increasing at price differently. And so while the vegetable oils are going through the roof, the, the wheat, which is what I'll come back to soon, is growing rapidly. Uh, dairy is, is kind of growing, but it's gone down. Meat and sugar, not, not so much. End result, is that we are looking at a rapid increase in the price of food. And this is something which is a problem in all countries. I'm sure the Australians are unhappy with your inflation, just as the Kiwis are unhappy with ours. But compared to other countries, which is what the graph in the middle is showing us, we aren't really going to feel it because we're not in poverty. Other countries are going to feel it very much. Now, in addition to the, so the price increases that we're looking at, according to the World Bank, this year, in general, is 23%. Uh, diff, that's the general figure. Some food sorts are increasing even quicker, which is wheat, which is looking at a 40% increase this year. These increases will go on over the 
following years as well. We don't expect this to be short term. There's a number of reasons for the price rises. It's like inflation in general. And it's critical to realize that the Ukrainian crisis is only one of the factors driving up the price of food. Now, what the graph on the right is trying to show you is that not all countries rely on food imports to the same degree. Some are much more vulnerable than others. So if you're looking at the wheat trade, you will find a country like Egypt get over 85% of its imports from both Russia and the Ukraine. You can then go down to Sub-Saharan Africa, to Turkey, all the way down to Pakistan and Bangladesh and Lebanon. What this is telling us is that we are not all sharing the same risk equally. Some countries are more exposed than others, and we can expect that their vulnerabilities will increase. These guesses of how prices will rise are assuming that everyone keeps playing by the rules and keeps trading in food. There is a risk that some countries will start hoarding food. And if that happens, then the prices could escalate even more. Which brings us to the Ukraine. Now, the significance of the Ukraine is that it's the driving factor right now in the price of food increasing. Uh, as a food source, the Ukraine is worth, it's a major cog, it's 15% of the world's wheat, which is one country, which is huge. In addition to their production and the blockade, which I shall mention soon, the Russians have been attacking storage facilities, uh, distribution networks, but they've worked out that the most effective way to actually stop the food exiting is to put the blockade around the country. Now, it's quite strange to see a blockade because even though I love my history, blockades were something of an earlier age. And so, so many recent wars don't contain blockades like we know of them or think of them today. But we've kind of got an informal blockade over the Black Sea and a formal blockade over the Sea of Azov. And so on the right um, above the Crimea, the Russians have said that that's blocked, that they've made it very clear that you cannot enter that area. With the Black Sea, it hasn't been, as I understand it, people have a different view on this, but my understanding is that it's been um, informally blockaded. And so what this means is that it's very dangerous for any vessels that are merchant vessels or military vessels to go into the region because of the amount of sea mines that are floating around. NATO has made it very clear that the, there is a risk of collateral damage. And the merchant vessels that are at some of these ports, irrespective of whether it's a formal or informal blockade, have worked out that it's just a very unsafe place to be. And that unsafe nature is also reflected in the increases in shipping costs and insurance costs. And so whether it's a formal blockade or informal blockade, a lot of merchant vessels are just thinking it's not worth the risk. And so they're not going to that part of the world. End result, the food's not getting out. That's having an impact on the price of food. And some countries are feeling that impact quicker than others. But one last point I wanted to note is that the food from Russia is still getting out. There seems to be some misapprehension that the Russians, the sanctions on Russia apply to food and fertilizer and seeds. That's not the case. There's no sanctions on Russian food, fertilizer or seed. So the, the restrictions right now are only coming through this part of the war. Now, what you've got here and where we've ended up is with three considerations and four options as I see them. First consideration, the Ukraine crisis is a big catalyst in the food problem that we've got right now, but it's not the only factor. So even if there was a complete free flow of food, 
you've still got to deal with inflation and you've still got to deal with a number of secondary concerns. Nonetheless, it's the foremost problem. Two, not everyone's facing the same risk. And in many ways, the risks will depend upon the poverty of the countries and their ability to get additional funds, reduce their debt levels, or diversify their food sources. Three, this is a difficult one. When international rules of war were developed in the 19th and 20th century, the idea was about the prohibition of starvation of victims inside the war zone. The laws of war were designed to protect people who were at war with each other. Yet what you've got now is completely unprecedented because you've got a situation where starvation is being enforced upon or malnutrition may be forced upon people who are not party to the conflict. In theory, what this would suggest is that it's a crime without a name. It's something we've never actually been before where the collateral damage falls upon those who are not at the forefront of the conflict. And it's not something that the laws of war currently cover. And so we'll have to revisit this in time to come. Where you go from here, you have got four options. Your first option, peace. And peace is a lovely idea, and I wholeheartedly support it. We may even know the modalities of what could be in a peace deal. But the problem is we have not even begun to talk. The two sides, I think Zelensky has put his hand out, but Putin is not. The two sides, Putin especially, is not ready to talk peace. And so that, that option of number one doesn't really apply. It's fanciful thinking. Option two, you make a deal. Putin has made clear that he will lift the blockade if the sanctions are lifted against Russia. This is um, a difficult option because if you do that, you will lose the economic coercion that is currently being applied against Mr. Putin. Your third option, and I have seen some recent scholarship around this, is that you force the blockade. You effectively try to demand that the, the Russians make way for um, <clears throat> merchant vessels to come in and are allowed access to get the food, to get the wheat, to get the grain and get it flowing again. This is exceptionally risky idea and it all works on the assumptions that the Russians would be willing to take a step back and lift the blockade voluntarily. If they don't, you're gonna walk into a major conflict. Your fourth option is you find alternative routes out of the Ukraine. Uh, the, and this is where you use the overland routes primarily through Poland which is the preferred option right now. The risk with this is that you aren't going to stop the price increases. You aren't going to get enough food out straight away. So you are looking at a, at least a short term famine. And if land and if the land and storage facilities are still targeted, it won't make much difference anyway. All you have to do is change the targeting of what's currently going on. Of course, the targeting is illegal under international law to target such things, but that's another discussion altogether. So here we go, here's the conclusion. One, we are in a difficult time. This is a period when the international architecture that we relied upon for so many decades to keep us safe is no longer working as it should. And what we're seeing is a revision to, tra to traditional alliances and a recalibration of the values of which we're prepared to stand up for. Two, the idea of famine and war is something which was practiced by humanity as a tactic for hundreds of years. It was prohibited by, from the middle of the 19th century, it became clear from the middle of the 20th century. But the problem is famine and the war zone were always interlinked. They were never thinking about famine outside the war zone because of the war. The blockade in the Ukraine is adding to the difficulties. In fact, it's the biggest problem we've got to deal with. But 
there are no good options on how we're going to deal with it. You've got the option of peace. You've got the option of a quid pro quo. You've got the option of trying to use force. Or then hopefully there might be something else we can think about with alternatives. But right now, the future, as this last picture is trying to show, is somewhat bleak. That's it. Yes, that <laughs> it is a it's a bleak picture. Um, Alexander, th thank you so much. That, that was a, a fascinatingly detailed presentation, and 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 thank you anyway for putting all that together. Really, really helpful to get that background. Um, what one of the things that struck me when you were showing um, you talking about the World Food Program and you showed the the World Food Program hunger map is the the extent of overlap. Uh, between some of those countries experienced hunger or famine um, and the countries that either abstained or voted against uh, the UN Security Council resolution against Russia. I mean, do, geopolitically, do you think some of those who were abstaining had obviously had not thought through the fact there could be this issue with food supply? Do you, I mean, do you see any change pressure coming from people rethinking their initial reluctance to support any action against Russia and the security I, council. I, thank you. Um, I've almost gonna stop making predictions because everything I've said in the last six months has been wrong. I, I never thought we'd be in this situation with, with a conflict. I, I always thought they'd actually back down. But to answer your specific question, the one that, that perplexes me the most right now is India. And, and, and so I thought, I just assumed India would be voting and standing with the countries, which we, the, the democracy, the liberal democracies. But even they, for various reasons, have chosen a more neutral path. And I think if you can't keep the loyalty of a country like India, it makes it much more difficult for the other countries. But what I'm increasingly seeing and what I fear is a division of developing during the world right now. It, it seems to my mind, it seems very much that there's two sides developing and I'm not sure we're in the majority anymore. Yeah, that's a point. I mean, a, a lot of this seems to, to go back to the whole makeup of the Security Council, the fact that one of the protagonists um, has, has the right of veto. <laughs> um, do you see any chance of that changing at all? What, what pressure can be brought to bear on that? Well, we, we made a... a ethically difficult decision in 1945 to, to agree to have to have the veto. There, there's been two options that the first one is that you expand the veto to, to the non-permanent fine. And that that appeals to some countries, but I think you'll just get more gridlock. But in terms of actual restricting the veto, the, the debate has been whether you restrict it over certain issues, such as genocide. And if and that was proposed as an idea and it was rejected. But, and if you can't agree to restrict the veto over genocide, you won't agree to it over anything. And, and so I think while we as small countries, no disrespect to Australia, but, but while we as small countries kind of talk about the ideal of restricting the veto and keeping it out of malicious purposes, the reality is it won't change. And we were prepared, I think many countries were prepared to live with that for a long time while the permanent five played by the rules. But when the permanent five like Russia have now turned itself upside down and violated the UN Charter and then used the veto to make sure that it's not condemned, that, that those assumptions we had, I think we can no longer rely on. Yes, because at, at, at some point, President Macron was uh, trying to make the case, I think, that you know humanitarian issues should not be subject to a veto. But I think you probably end up down the same rabbit hole that it's changing, as you say, what was put into place in 1945. Well, you have that. You've also got a situation where France and Britain very rarely use the veto anymore. It's an exceptional thing when they will use it. 
but you're seeing, uh, I mean, America will use it largely, typically with regards to Israel to make sure that there's no criticism of them. But what the trend is, is the increasing use of it by China. And so even though Russia dominates, the, the, the balance is moving. So, so you've got two superpowers which are being silent. You've got America as an outlier, but it's used even more. And so I, I track this trend more or less to the beginning of the 21st century. But we're th those nice Monica Lewinsky years that I mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I don't think we're going back to them. I think there was that period in the 1990s when we were actually quite utopian and it appeared that advances were possible and we worked well in the Security Council. We got peacekeepers into the into Yugoslavia, for example. But but that is all post 2001. It, it seems to have declined. Um, you, you talked about, um, well, the, the, the issue of ecological scarcity of food came up and you said it, it's more um, economical, but it is, is actually the, um, a, a, the corollary of this that the, the amount of fertilizer also that comes out of yeah. Russia or Ukraine, um, is that a, you know, an un, unintended consequence that it is possibly going to lead to ecological scarcity? It, it, it is possible. The, the, the reason I underlined that twice was that a lot of Malthusian thinking comes into this debate that people kind of go, well, there's too many of them. You know, they're, they're, they've overpopulated. They're going to starve themselves to death anyway. And in, in the future, that, that may be an issue. In the future, we may not have enough food to actually feed the world. But we, we do have enough food now to feed the world. But we, we choose not to feed the world because we can we can make more money selling it to people who are wealthier. And so like I, I know that your trade balance with China, like our trade balance with China, we're, we're very dependent. But if we stopped selling some of our food to China and sent it to Africa, for example, you could save a lot of people's lives. But the bottom line is you won't make the same amount of money. And, and so, so it, we can be pragmatic and honest and try to keep the prices down but there is enough food there right for now but in the longer term that's a question mark yeah how, how do you how do you think this affects the world food program going, going back to them and, and what they're trying to do to alleviate hunger and, and famine i mean i suppose they they are stymied as well by the fact that they don't have access to those food supplies that are blockaded that, that's right. Well, I mean, the, the World Food Programme, to my mind, is one of the great successes of the United Nations. It's an undersung hero. And the, it's, a, it's something that a lot of countries give a lot of money to. And it, it's been successful. But as the scarcity starts to increase, and, and my, my fear is, is not that the price increases slowly. It's that countries suddenly think, crikey, we're going to hold on to what we've got. And, and you go back to that kind of protectionist thinking where they refuse to trade. And if that happens, then all bets are off the table with how countries will respond. And in that situation, the, the World Food Program, it will still be able to get food, but the donations to it will have to grow exponentially. And for countries which are already facing inflation and their own social crises, to give more money to the UN and these agencies will be a real challenge. But you are, you are seeing everyone, the, the World Bank, the IMF, the Secretary General, they're all singing up the same song sheet. They can all see it coming where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, you talked about peace as an option, but as I said, it's very, it's very difficult to um, see how quickly that's going to come or, or how it will come. Um, you know, are there, are there any other options to, to bring down the food price? I mean, supply chains are, are being really constrained is say ports blockaded you can't get shipping in and out it's far cheaper to to move by ship rather than by land um raw materials i mean there's there's presumably very few other options to try and bring down the food price well but the, and this is what i was trying to say that the we, we focus on the the ukraine blockade is a large part of the problem but the driving difficulty is price and price is being driven up more than just by the Ukraine. And so when people say, well, let's force the Ukraine, that won't necessarily solve the problem. And the, the price has been escalating rapidly. It, you can date it pretty clearly to the beginning of COVID. 
and, and when, when COVID hit, everything, as we all know, just went upside down. And it hasn't really stabilized since then. It will take a couple of years before the macro conditions can start to calm down. And I, I think we're now starting to see the movements that we need in the markets with the reserve banks working quite well. But that won't work straight away for the poor developing countries because a lot of these countries have now got growing debt, which is going to expose them even more. And, and we even see that in the Pacific right now. Absolutely. And I mean, I suppose other, other institutions like the, the International Criminal Court, there's a um, limited amount they can do. There was a lot of talk in the past of the responsibility to protect, but that, I suppose, almost takes you down the avenue if you're going to be in direct confrontation with Russia, if you... Well, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's where we have to hand it over to, to you folks in international politics, as opposed to us folks in international law. But because because I, I can quote you verse about where the laws have been broken and what people shouldn't do. But the reality is, and like, you know, whether Putin is a war criminal, and in theory, sure, that, that's true. But the reality is he's never going to be brought to justice in The Hague. You know, and and so that, that gap between the theory and the practice is, is becoming increasingly large. And so when we start to think about what to do with the blockade, it's not a question of what's legally right. It's a question of what's politically feasible. And, and the risks there, are you're dealing with people's lives in terms of starvation and numbers, or you're dealing with the risk of conflict. And from the I mean, perspective of Russia itself, um, are, they, are they at risk of shortages in, in the same, same way at all through this? Or are they, are they sufficiently self-sufficient they can get through? I, I, I think for, for food, they're, they're fine. But you, um, you, you may have seen on the, the news cycle this afternoon, they've made their first default on sovereign debt since 1917 today. Uh -huh. I hadn't seen that. That's, and and, that's and so I think I think your economy is starting to really shake, and and so that's why we we know food wise they're fine. They, they've got no problem. They've got a large surplus of vodka as well, so they'll so they'll, they'll survive for a while. But the the economic impact is starting to bite. But I also think that the Russians are very strong and tough people, and they have a great capacity for pain. But if we make that deal, because the deal that's on the table is we will stop the blockade if you lift the sanctions. And, and so that, that these are the kind of mind games that you could only think up in a university. That, and whether people would actually do that or not, I, I don't know. Because if you lift the blockade, you will, you will save people's lives. You will. The price will come down. That's true. But on the other hand, you will lose all your coercion over Russia and the economic area yeah and what what role if any do you see china playing they potentially could bring some pressure to bear but i don't know <laughs> I, you know if, if i'm honest i had a couple of very sleepless nights when the invasion first happened as i'm sure you did as well because many people would have recognized that if there was a time to strike taiwan that was the perfect time to, to, to do it on two fronts at the same place but they didn't, and they, 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 China has sat more on the fence than I expected them to do. I don't think they've been particularly supportive of Russia, but they haven't been antagonistic either. And so right now, I think they're also just watching to see how the Ukraine responds militarily and to see the, the unity in the West, because the, the big bet right now that Putin is working on is how long the West can absorb inflation and its own economic costs to keep the pressure on him. And so I think China's watching this with great interest, with a large bowl of popcorn, because they'll be curious to see if whether we, we can stay together. And they'll be curious to see whether we'll, that support we've got for the Ukraine will continue. And we're going to see that over the next few days at the NATO meeting, because your prime minister is there. Mm -hmm. Australia's in deeper than New Zealand is in. And whether they'll be expected to give more or not, uh, I think. Well, I think we will. I think everyone will be asked, expected to give more. Yeah, I, I was going to come on to the NATO meetings. It, it's quite, um, it, it's unusual for Australia to be there. I mean, it, it's quite um, significant to, 
that's um <laughs> uh, Patrick, so, yeah is there any anything you expect out of the nato summit in madrid other than a, a talking shop at this point the i'm you guys are one step closer to nato than we are Mm -hmm. But I mean, obviously, we can't become members because we're not North Atlantic, but, but your relationship is closer with them than we are. I think that there might be more invitations to, to NATO work, which could be useful. There could be a greater emphasis on interoperability between forces. And, and I think that, that that's something I argue for for New Zealand and Australia anyway. But, but then because of the AUKUS agreement, you guys have taken a quantum leap away from us and and that that will be a challenge i i correct me if i'm wrong but but you already give two percent of your gdp to the military don't you i believe so don't quote me on that. yeah we're we're, we're, we're only one point, we're, we're, we're 1. 1.6 mm. and so i think we may see more of an increase the thing everyone's fascinated about here is whether our prime ministers actually go to the ukraine and make a visit because the symbolism of that would be fantastic. But at the same time, Mr. Putin is busy putting cruise missiles down into the city center. Yes. So it, it would be, he's clearly saying, don't come. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a, a, a question that, well, I, it, it's possibly a bit out of our, our remit, but just, you know, talking, coming back to the issue of ecological scarcities is not just the amount of food available but loss of of biodiversity if you know if we don't have access to yeah. that ukrainian food basket bread basket for some time you know to, to what extent can other parts of the world make up for it maybe maybe they can't well it, and i i don't think i think the ukraine I, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable of the particular biodiversity that comes from the ukraine but I, don't, I, I know it's a, a large producer by, by volume, but I'm not sure in terms of seed banks. I know Russia is important for seed banks and some of the Nordic countries, but hopefully in the longer term, that, that's something that could be reconciled. This is much more of a short term problem of what we do, because it's, it's the one thing that is actually foreseeable now that unless there is change very quickly, we're going to see starvation that this generation is not familiar with. And so, so when I was making the point about the Bob Galdorf from the Live Aid, a lot of people can remember that and that, that kind of starvation. But we may be going back to something even worse than that if it comes through. And the way countries respond is people don't starve in silence anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the risk is, is that if a country goes into a, a period of starvation, civil conflict can break out, the conflicts can spread, yeah. and the regional ramifications can be large. Yes, and I, th I think the other knock-on effect with Ukraine is, is, of course, apart from whatever is in storage that um, can't be shipped out, and I, I don't know what its uh, shelf life is, but of course they, they've now basically missed a harvest. That's right. And, and you know, there's, there's going to be a knock-on effect for another year, at least, I, I imagine. So. And, and in many ways, it's not the physical volume of the food that's the knock-on, it's the price which is the knock-on, yep. but because the scarcity that will drive that up, and unless you can actually get that to flow, then the problem will continue to compound. Yeah, yeah. Well, Alex, it, it's been it's been a fascinating, somewhat uh, depressing. <laughs> to, Sorry about that. It's uh, well, but it, it, I think it's good to have some realistic perspective, but a, but a, a, a different perspective. So um, we were pretty much um, out of time, I'm afraid. But um, thank you very much for your for your presentation for taking part. Um, late in the evening as i said for for you but really really appreciate your insights and and it's been great talking to you so you're very welcome i very much enjoyed it thank you alistair well thank you very much and thank you to the audience for for the interesting questions and and we'll be we'll be following up again soon so um i'll sign off thank you again very much alexander we'll talk to you again before too long ahead so thanks again for taking part